This Week in Radio Tech, episode 221, is brought to you by the Telos HX6 and IQ6 talk show systems. Six lines and two advanced hybrids for perfect color conferencing. And by Lavo and the new crystal clear touchscreen audio console. Intuitive, progressive, and focused. For most of us engineers, our jobs would be easier if our colleagues understood a bit more about broadcast engineering. Skip Peasy has finished updating his fourth edition of a broadcast engineering tutorial for non-engineers. He joins us for a fascinating look at his updated book and how both engineers and non-engineers benefit from broadening their engineering horizons. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Radio Technology, episode 221, 221. I'm Chris Tobin. I'm also a uh, IP consultant, IP solutionist. I help people solve problems that they didn't know they had. No, I'm only kidding. I try to help workflows, and my 30 years in broadcasting has somewhat given me an insight as to the craziness we all enjoy as uh, radio and TV engineers. Uh, also, hosting, uh, not hosting this week, but on video file server, I'll call it, not tape, is Kirk Harnack. He's the host of the show. I'm a co-host. Chris Tarr and Tom Ray are on location uh, on assignment. I guess we'll use the terminology. So Kirk is uh, joined by Skip Peasy in a pre-recorded interview to talk about where things are going in the radio and TV, engineering, uh, where our lives will wind up in 20 years with the way multimedia, new media, broadcasting, IP, everything is just changing. The world around us is just you know, spinning like crazy. Then again, it's always spinning 24 hours a day. So uh, before we get into the video, it's about a 37-minute video. So uh, after I'm done this sponsorship moment, take a quick break, run out, get something to drink, come back, and get ready for a very good interview with Skip Peasy. And we all know Skip, and those of you who don't, you'll find out more about him during the video. But speak about our sponsor, Lavo. Now, it's spelled L-A-W-O. It's a German company. Its pronunciation is Lavo. That's the way it goes. Don't ask me why. It's just that that's it. But Lavo does consoles. They do uh, mixing equipment. They do things that many of us come across uh, with other manufacturers. But they've decided to do something different, still using a console approach. They call it, uh, let me make sure I have, this, I have to get this just right, because if I don't, everybody will be so upset. It's a crystal clear. Crystal clear is a virtual audio console. So think of a work surface like a touch screen. And now you have a touch screen which is multi-touch enabled, which is even better. And you have a uh, GUI, the graphic user interface, and now you just touch, right? My fingers are going on the screen for those of you who watch and those who are listening. Think of it as a, like a smartphone with the multi-touch capability. Now you can mix and match audio sources. You can do pre-fade listen or cueing. You can do, uh, uh, what do you call it, the typical mixing of, of audio, as you would say, at a studio. Or think of it on location, but using IP. So you're interconnected with IP. Using DSP technology, digital signal processing, they're able to do everything in real time, do it in a very fashionable manner that's mission critical, time sensitive that we're all accustomed to. It's broadcast grade. Uh, the equipment is designed in such a way that, boy, I tell you, the last time we spoke to Mike Dosh, who's a part of the Lavo team, and if you know Mike, know his history, he comes from a background of designing consoles. Maybe you've heard the three letters BMX, or maybe you've heard AMX. Now people are really going crazy. Well, if you've heard those three initials and you know who they, what they are and who made them, then you know that Jack Williams did a very nice job of understanding workflow and trying to bring things to the forefront back in the day. Well, Lavo has now taken the same approach and is now bringing things to the forefront today. Today, it's touchscreen, multi-touch capability. So Crystal Clear gives you that ability. It's pretty cool. You've got to go to the website, lavo.com, and check out more of the details. But you have talk buttons that automatically appear on mix minus channels, and you have the, you know, the guests have talk back, all the stuff you'd expect. But it's a touch screen. See, look, I'm touching the camera. So if I could take my, my smartphone and, and make adjustments with it, how cool is that? Now, again, I'm going to use this example. I did it once before. You're doing a broadcast. Say it's a concert, and it's in, a, in Hyde Park in the UK, and you've decided that I can't bring everybody out to the event because a lot of the presenters we're going to use are going to be elsewhere doing stuff. So what do you do? You take this crystal clear engine, you bring it out to the site, you plug in all the audio sources into it, right? all the microphones and everything else you're doing. And then with IP, you bring back all that information to your studio where you have the mixing console. Now you have your work surface. And now you can mix and create a great OB event. But yet, you're physically back at the home base where you have all your resources to do more things, add more stuff. So you have a, an engine there. You bring everything into that. You bring everything into the remote site. And now you've got yourself, a, you, you orchestrate a broadcast that, well, 
20 years ago, you couldn't even think it'd be done. Now you can. And because Crystal Clear gives you a point of sale quality touchscreen capability, multi-touch that is, oh, point of sale, yes. Well, when you go to your favorite restaurant and you place an order or you, you get your reservation prepared and the hostess or host touches the screen at their countertop, that's a point of sale terminal. It's designed with a little extra robustivity. That's right. You want to be able to tap that glass a little harder than usual than you would say at home on your, your uh, iPad or, or Android tablet. So crystal clear, Lavo, their product, they design it. They say, okay, you're in a console environment, in a studio where you have multiple fingers touching different people. That's the way it goes. Just face, face the facts, okay? Your studio environment is hostile. End of story. But with Lavo and crystal clear, you now have the ability to do more which means if you can do more, you can generate revenue. If you generate revenue, you keep your job. So at the end of the day, you buy Lavo, crystal clear console, you generate revenue, you keep your job. Is it as simple as that? Yes, because it's IP, you plug and play. Your imagination is what's going to limit you. So if you're not a very imaginative person because maybe you're a, uh, an accountant, time to take a break, step away, and learn how to be imaginative. But if you are an engineer or a broadcast producer and you understand all the intricacies of both multi-touch and uh, producing and the technologies that go in between the IP, you got yourself a home run. So give it a try. Lavo.com, all right, www.lavo, L-A-W-O.com. Check it out. It's called Crystal Clear Virtual Audio Console. There's a few other things you can do with it, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You need to go to the website and read about it because that's more important that you read it, take a look at your workflow and say, where does this plug and play? And once you have that understanding, then if you'd like, drop me an email. I'll give you more details, and we'll talk about you buying it and going in and having a fun time. Okay? That's all I got for you for now. We'll come back with more of that later on. So let's go to the video of Kirk Harnack. Skip Peasy spoke earlier this week. It's on a video file server. I won't say let's go to the tape. It's on video file. So if Andrew back in the studio would be so kind as to... Hit that button and let's hear from Kirk and, and Skip and have some fun. So for 37 minutes, sit back and be educated on stuff for the non-technical engineer. That's what this is going to be about. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack. Welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. And we have a guest this week that I'm delighted that we were able to record an interview with him uh, earlier in the week. And our guest is uh, Skip Peasy. Hey, welcome in, Skip. Thanks, Kirk. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Good to see you, too. You're, looks like you're in the NAB studio there. I am indeed our uh, basement studio. Well, it looks it looks like you took over the Charlie Rose studio. It's uh, nice and dark in the background. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Skip, you, uh, uh, we, I've known you for years. In fact, I was just so delighted you asked me to write some articles for you uh, back. Oh my goodness, that must have been uh, twenty years ago when you were at um, what became Radio Magazine. Yeah, right. Wow. Back then. Yeah. yeah, it's been a while. We won't, though. Who's counting, right? <laughs> yes, goodness. Um, so now you're Senior Director of New Media Technologies at NAB. Well, most of us know what the NAB is, the National Association of Broadcasters, but what does that mean about being Senior Director of New Media Technologies? Yeah, it's a good question. When, I, we have a saying around here. It says, when do you stop calling it new? Uh, <laughs> at some point, it, it becomes just media, right? Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, there's always something new coming down the pipe. And so the target keeps shifting. The title probably can stay uh, current, even though what it's talking about is always something new. And it's kind of an unusual thing for broadcasting. We, we tend to think that broadcasting has been super stable for so many years. And I guess if you compare it to, say, the internet, that's true. But it's not like broadcasters haven't been innovating all along. Um, <clears throat> we get kind of beat up about that today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's um, uh, not really warranted. Uh, if you actually look at it, the, uh, the fact is broadcasting has been innovating for uh, its entire history. Hence the fact that we're already to the fourth edition of this book. Um, and boy, I'll tell you, having just gone through the, the the revision from the third edition, which wasn't that old, there was a ton of stuff to change and stuff that had become outdated just since uh, 2008 or so. Hmm. Um, and <clears throat> so that's the, the testimony right there to the amount of stuff that's always new media coming in to 
the broadcast world and, and stuff that broadcasters are adopting and uh, taking on and applying to their industry and moving forward with. I should introduce the book that you're speaking about. You said the, the fourth edition of the book. This is yep. the book. It right. is called A Broadcast Engineering Tutorial for Non-Engineers. Now, it says right here, fourth edition, but I didn't realize that this book was already out before until you mentioned it's the fourth edition. I, I guess I hadn't paid attention and seen this on the shelves until right. I saw the, your name associated with it, Skip Peasy. Now, were you <laughs> it, responsible for previous editions as well? No, this is the first time I've been, um, uh, well, I, I just joined NAB in 2010. Mm -hmm. As I said, this the third edition of this book predated that. So <clears throat> my co-author on this, Graham Jones, uh, was the sole author of the third edition. Uh, he'd since retired from NAB and kind of handed over uh, the third edition, plus some work that he had done um, thinking about the next edition, uh, and then I took it from there. So that's why we're, we're listed as co-authors uh, on here. But I was managing the project on this book, and as I said, uh, Graham and I went back and forth a bit, and then uh, he, he gave his final stamp of approval to the whole thing when we were done. And the uh, point is, uh, as I said, lot, lots and lots of changes. I, I want to point out to our audience who may not be familiar with you, Skip is an accomplished writer uh, for, for many years and, and uh, magazine editor and otherwise content editor. Uh, here's a book that Steve uh, at Church wrote along with Skip Peasy called uh, Audio over IP Building Pro AOIP Systems from Livewire. This is uh, the company I work for and the sponsor of, of the show, uh, uh, Telos Omnia Axia. This this is our Bible. Uh, we uh, we uh, hand this out to folks and encourage uh, other folks to buy it. And so, uh, uh, Skip, what uh, uh, you know, the title says a lot, a broadcast engineering tutorial for non-engineers. Why is this book important? Why is it needed? Well, uh, as you say, it's somewhat self-explanatory from the title. Um, it's really an attempt to try to make the technology of broadcasting which uh, is always, has always been important, particularly for engineers. It's even more important to the non-engineers in the industry nowadays for a number of reasons. One of which, let's face it, um, engineering is becoming a little bit of an endangered species in this world as we um, you know, kind of uh, apply payroll compression algorithms, shall we say, to uh, a lot of businesses. Um, <clears throat> so the engineers aren't aren't present as much as they used to be, at least not on a day-to-day -day basis, where you can just run down the hall and say, hey, this isn't working, or you know, explain how this works to me. So <clears throat> there's a need for the non-engineers at our facilities to be able to be a little more sort of DIY, a little, little more sort of self-sufficient, right? So that's one reason to get um, th this book in the hands of the folks who need it. The other is that uh, it, it things change fast. And so folks that might have been current with technology a few years ago might need to get up to speed. And that's one of the big changes in this fourth edition is that it really deals with the Internet, which wasn't much of a factor right. back in the third edition. Uh, and in fact, the third edition came out when we were still broadcasting an NTSC uh, at, at, in the simulcast period with yeah. DTV. And now this is the first edition to be in the pure digital era for television. Um, <clears throat> and, and an increasingly digital environment for radio with HD radio. So we talk about that and also we talk about international things a little more because it is becoming a bit of a one world uh, and particularly in the internet which knows really very few global boundaries. We're trying to uh, present it that way. And I guess there's a final element which is radio folks that might want to learn about TV or vice versa for their uh, extended uh, versatility. And that applies even to engineers um, <clears throat> who might want to learn, you know, us, us old radio guys, uh, TV is just that, you know, radio with pictures. How do them pictures work? Well, this uh, might be helpful for them as well as for students. A lot of teachers use, have been using this book since back in the uh, third edition or even before as a text in RTF type um, departments where it's not an engineering curriculum, but folks want to learn a little bit about how the technology works. You know, I just realized this book is a, is a bit like a, a Wikipedia summary of every subject in, <laughs> uh, in modern broadcast. Uh, so Skip, you know, at our SBE meetings uh, here in Nashville, you know, the TV engineers all kind of sit together and, and uh, th their conversation seems to always involve 
the phrase PSIP generator. Well, here, look, I look in your book, and on page 174 is PSIP <laughs> generator. Now, this right. is great for me. Uh, I can look at this and at least understand what they're talking about. Yeah, there you go. Without uh, the embarrassment of having to ask what an acronym stands for in public, right? It's a great uh, use of the book right there. But we talk about, uh, I should mention, of course, uh, both uh, radio and TV uh, in every case. Radio is always first, um, and then television follows. Uh, the book structured kind of in a way that you could, if you wanted to, read it uh, from front to back. Mm -hmm. starts very high level, talking about just the whole concept of broadcasting. And then it drills into studio uh, equipment and systems, and then goes into transmission equipment and systems, really, because when you think about it, broadcasting is a uh, two-part business. Mm -hmm. um, it in the early days, we didn't really think about when where one ended and the other began. But nowadays, <clears throat> there really are two separate industries that we're working in because that's the way our competitors have come about to be more or less in one or the other. Yeah. And so it's really important to think about those separately. And as I say, in each case, we talk about radio and we talk about television for um, all, all those uh, environments. You know, it's been said in radio for years that uh, a, a smart radio station manager will take a couple hours and go with the engineer to the transmitter site mm -hmm. so that he can understand what's going on out there and, and you know what condition it's in, what the engineer might need. Or uh, This is a great book for a CEO, for a, a regional managing uh, manager to, to read or a, or a local manager so he can better understand the, the challenges and the possibilities. I mean... Boy, think about the days when when RDS was uh, was coming into into play, R RBDS in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And engineers like myself were trying to explain to managers why we ought to have this. And invariably, I tell you, the managers that that I worked with uh, said, "Well, who, who's got a radio to pick this up?" Well, nobody yet. But well, <laughs> well, then never mind. Don't bother me with it. Well, then ten years later, manager goes right. and buys a a, a car, a, a new Jaguar, right? right? And he turns on the radio, and the competitors' mm -hmm. call letters are on there but not ours. And he runs <laughs> yeah. to me and he says, how come our call letters aren't on the radio? Well, right. because 10 years ago I asked you to buy this piece of, well, get it. I don't care what it costs, get it. Right. <laughs> Maybe this yeah. can avoid that kind of stuff. There you go, yeah. Uh, we, we try not to be too far out there in blue sky. Mm -hmm. We're talking about pretty much current stuff, but we do talk a little bit about what we see as next gen as well. So hopefully it'll last for a while. Because uh, we don't want to have to do another uh, edition of this, uh, you know, in, a, in within a, a year or two, it'd be nice to let it have a little bit longer uh, on the shelves before the the next edition. But you're right; that's really exactly the target, or one of the targets that we're thinking about is that manager to say, "How could I apply this?" And today, that's really the kind of agility that we need uh, in broadcasting. On a much higher, to a much higher degree than we've had in the past. Our our revision cycles within our own services, uh, including things like metadata and things that other services, competing services, have had already since day one, and what we can now incrementally add, uh, are important. And the idea that, in fact, we may have one studio, but we may send content from that studio out over multiple transmission or delivery platforms. And that's another thing that the book addresses uh, in some detail about the fact that it's, you're not just feeding that one transmitter with that one studio anymore. It's a much bigger ecosystem. I'm, just, I'm paging through here. And you know, I bought this book at the NAB, so I've had it for a, a few months, but I hadn't taken a good look at it yet. And now I'm, I'm paging through it and saying, th you know, these, these are all the basic things that I wish... Uh, my colleagues at, at stations that I've done engineering for, I wish that, that they knew. And a lot of things here that I've explained to them. So, wow, this, uh, this really does a nice job. So now, the video part of this. I'm, okay, radio stations, there are still plenty of radio stations that are all analog uh, inside, yeah. right? And, sure. and transmitting analog. Um, but TV stations, if you go to TV stations in the U.S., will you still find NTSC equipment? Not really. I mean, you may find a couple of old um, tape machines just in case they have to pull something out of the archives. Yeah. But other than that, it's pretty much digital uh, signal chain. Uh, and, and it kind of has to be. And in fact, you can't hardly buy 
any of that uh, analog stuff much anymore. In some other countries, yeah, but not, not so much in the US, not readily available. Um, nevertheless, that said, there's still a lot of formats and updates and things in the digital world that uh, folks are continuing to upgrade as they go along. And we're about to see that, uh, particularly in backhaul. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, that, that's a moving target as it always is. And it's also in radio. We're about to see another new generation of coding come into play in the TV world. Mm -hmm. The uh, so-called HEVC, the next gen from MPEG, or it's, uh, in the ITU world, they call it H.265. And uh, new first products are, are coming in on that right now. And uh, so that's a, 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 another thing that the t TV guys are going to have to get used to. And we're seeing, um, you know, there, there's something in the book uh, about that. But as you said, I think you hit on a good point. A lot of this stuff we've had to pick up as we went along from any number of sources, wherever you catch as catch can to get new input. And of course, the internet and a search engine helps a lot in the, you know, just in time training, as we call it. But this book, we tr attempted to try to put it all into one stop, you know, a one stop shopping exercise for anything that you, you need. And uh, it can be a desk reference, or it can be something like, say, that you read to cover to cover, or just uh, a teacher can apply sections or chapters of it to the class for whatever needs they have, whether it's radio or television, whether it's production or transmission. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, any engineer who uh, needs to brush up his skills a little bit, this is this is certainly the way to go. You know, in, in, in the radio business, there's been a lot of talk about the disappearance of ISDN. Yeah. And uh, not as much in other countries, although in some countries have some countries skipped ISDN altogether. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I, I was in well, I was in uh, Poland uh, about eight or nine years ago. And I was uh, told by a broadcaster they were moving from one place to another and at the new place. This was eight years ago. They yeah. couldn't get POTS or ISDN service at the new place at all. It was only IP. Wow. And then, yeah. That was this many years ago. So uh, uh, how's the book addressing the disappearance of some technologies? Yeah, we, 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 we keep a lot of stuff in there for historical reasons because um, some of it is just of interest to um, the, the sort of classics. Uh, a little bit it's still about NTSC in there for that reason. Mm -hmm and uh, early digital technologies, things that are pretty much obsolete now, but we wanted to keep a little bit in there for the, for the historical record. But mostly we're talking about uh, a lot about IP and the transition to that, both in the studio and probably in the next gen, for example, the next gen TV broadcast system. Uh, it's the, in this country, we're calling it ATSC 3.0. Uh, although that spec won't be done probably for at least another year or so, uh, and then the products beyond that, they've already made the decision that it's going to be an IP-based system. And so it's going to be IP broadcasting, which is something that um, we don't really do yet uh, in this country uh, in either radio or TV, even digital radio and digital television. We're not putting out IP. We're putting out transport stream of one form or another. Yeah. And this movement to IP is going to be literally end-to-end. -end. And uh, we think that'll help also broadcasting be a little more easily integrated with some of these other so-called competitive technologies that are all out there and make it simpler and cheaper for uh, consumer equipment to at least share some of that stack, uh, as we call it, in uh, terms of the, the at least some pieces of the, of, of the, the, the system that uh, won't be super broadcast specific as, uh, as much as they can share that incredible economy of scale that IP has brought to pretty much the entire telecommunications world. If you visit any number of television stations and you get a tour of the, of the rack rooms and uh, the facilities, and the, the, the ingest equipment and the, and the, the, the studio transmitter links, um, at more than one station, an engineer has pointed to a box to me and said, and this is the most important box in the TV station. Right. Really? What is it? <laughs> That's your STL, some kind of encoder? No, this is the box that carries our signal over to the cable company's head end across town. <laughs> and I said, what, that's more important than the transmitter? Absolutely. Transmitter can go off and we lose, uh, you know, 18% of our audience. This right. goes off and we lose the other 
what is it, 72 percent of our of our audience. Talk to me about about surprising things in, let's say, TV stations uh, that that we <laughs> didn't know were so important. Yeah. Uh, the, originally, of course, cable head ends um, and even to some extent satellite uh, direct satellite broadcasting took its feed uh, their their feeds of their local live broadcast television services off the air mm. uh, and uh, then retransmitted it onto their cable plant. Mm-hmm. Um, with digital particularly, that's a pretty good way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still some transcoding that has to happen uh, and additional compression, unfortunately, that sometimes happens. And uh, there's even this weird thing that we just learned about the danger of putting signals freely out to the air like we do. It's part of our DNA as broadcasters. And then a company like Aereo can come along and say, well, you know what? We're going to build a, make, make a business model out of that, um, which, of course, is what cable and satellite does. But under regulations and, and uh, bilateral agreements that compensate the broadcaster for it. And Aereo was saying, we don't have to do that. We can. This stuff is free to air. We're just giving you more eyeballs and putting it on the internet for you. And um, oh, and charging our customers to build that business on your backs. And so there's a, so a lot of issues about this whole idea of what the free to tr- air transmission gives us, both pro and con. And so that's a lesson that broadcasters are learning and thinking about what new systems we might need for security. Um, for securing our still free-to-air content. Um, and this is an area that broadcasters really have never had to deal with, never wanted to deal with, really, because it is free-to-air. That's our model, right? And nevertheless, we're looking like we need some sort of protection, content protection. So this is an area that we find when we start talking about it, there is no homegrown experience. And we've got to go to outside parties and we're all trying to be, you know, trying to study up on the whole idea of adding encryption to signals. And yeah, the other nice thing about that is it could offer, uh, open up opportunities for additional business models that typically broadcasters haven't done. But if you had a, a TV or radio service where you put multicasts up, three or four different programs, one of them could be a subscription channel. You know, this you could do your whole long tail thing on your own multiplex, where your most popular stuff is free to air, and your less popular things are either on demand, protected, or even live but encrypted. Um, and those get you know fewer users, but those users who are that into it might be willing to pay for it, and you have a way to to do that. So lots of new things on the plate. I wonder if you might end up with a model that is a, a bit like um, C-band satellite became where stuff you don't really want to watch, like all the shopping channels and Do- Dr. Gene Scott, <laughs> whoever it was, you know, uh, it, it, people who don't care how many eyeballs watch and don't care to be compensated directly for those eyeballs, uh, th- that's free to air. But if you want to watch, right. you know, the new edition of Law, you know, the new episode of Law and Order, that's going to cost you. That would right. be an interesting model. And then where would we go with this notion of the public airwaves? Um, you know, broadcasters perhaps charging money using the public airwaves, does it feel like maybe someday we won't have an over-the-air model anymore? Um, I don't think so. I think there's always a need for, um, uh, there's going to be a need for the over-the-air model. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, also, it's an American thing, the sort of egalitarian, open, f- free-to-everyone kind of, um, you know, it's, it's part of our, our democracy, that sort of, free public forum where air, for airing of issues and ideas at the very least. But there's also good business in it because it's what we now call infinitely scalable. Mm-hmm. It's like, we didn't know we were infinitely scalable, but now that's a new cocktail party word that we can use as broadcasters and say, you realize, of course, that we're infinitely scalable. And that, that was one of those things we always were, but never knew there was an advantage to it until, you know, compared to what? It's like, when they wrote the old history books about World War One, they didn't call it World War One because World War Two hadn't come along right, yet, and they had right. to change the name after the fact. Right. So same thing like that. We're infinitely scalable. There's a need for that. If nothing else besides emergency alerting and other kinds of really crisis important things where everybody comes to this the, the service at once, um, when you've got a 
uh, a non-scalable or, or limited uh, scalability service, like everything is basically on any kind of network, internet included, you're, you're, you're always going to have a limited capacity. And you're either going to slow down the service or crash it um, or, or, or have other you know, non-optimal um, uh, experiences for the consumer. Whereas broadcasters never will have that problem, never. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say 99%. We can say with, with absolute impunity, we will never have a problem serving as many people. You know, it truly is infinite. And there's not a lot of things you can say that about in today's technology. So that's one thing, one reason alone. Plus, there are some other, I think, good business reasons, regulatory reasons, even legal reasons to, to have that um, free-to-air broadcast service continue. And yeah, there's going to be a continuing number of new competitors, but broadcasting can, as a secondary business, get into a lot of those other businesses. But broadcasters are the only ones who can be in both places, right? Uh, free-to-air, infinitely scalable, as well as other services that, you know, your economy of scale, having the means of production and studios and people and all that, all those assets brought together and archive. I mean, you know, the things that broadcasters all have at their fingertips that can be pulled together and repurposed to send out other kinds of streams that are online, on demand, and so forth. Broadcasters are the only ones who can be in all those places. So as I like to say, it's, it's broadcasters' game to lose going forward in the future because you have that license to the scarce resource of free-to-air and you also can play in these other environments, new media, as we say. Um, and having the best of both worlds there is, I think, a pretty good recipe for continued success. Seems like uh, your your next book ought to be more on the subject of what we're talking about now the the the, the ideas and philosophy of of our broadcasting model and where where things are going. Uh, I mean, just as a consumer, I'm a little bit worried. Um, you know, uh, uh, take for example, I'm, I'm I'm not a, a prize fighting fan, but uh, if I was if I was, uh, you know, it's been years since I could watch uh, a free to air uh, heavyweight uh, boxing match, right? Yeah, uh, got yeah. got to pay for that now. Um, right. Uh, Major League Baseball. I'm I'm not a big sports fan, but if I was, I'll bet you, I would probably need to subscribe to some things in order to watch the games that I wanted. Didn't used to have that, but also didn't used to have much choice either. Whatever my local affiliates were carrying is what I could watch. So maybe right. that hasn't changed a whole lot in real terms. Um, but during this debate over over the Aereo decision, uh, there was a, a lot of back and forth uh, on 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 internet forums and Facebook um, about well, hey broadcasters actually are coming to a point where they may make more money if people don't see it free over the air, but they see it through some subscription uh, service. Uh, 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 ABC Television had an app that I could watch Castle right. from the night before. I can't do that anymore unless I've subscribed the cable now. I, I have to tell ABC's app who my cable provider is. Well, I, and I bring this up because it hits home. I live right in Nashville, Tennessee. I can pick up over the air every affiliate that there is except the abc affiliate it's four their tower is four miles behind my house but i've got a knife edge ridge between uh, my and a spectrum analyzer proves i can't pick them up unless i put a hundred foot tower and i think the city of oak hill is not going to like that so i can't pick up free over to the i can't watch castle for free i can't watch nashville for free cannot i have to subscribe to comcast or a direct uh, you know, broadcast satellite service, Dish or, 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 or Direct, in order to watch it. And I used to be able to watch it with ABC's app. Now I can't. So as a consumer, I feel a little bit put out here about where the model is going. Uh, we're, we're far afield from this fantastic book here, but maybe maybe you have some thoughts on, on uh, you know, I don't feel like broadcasters are serving me because I, I, can't, I can't watch it anymore. Yeah, th this is what, well, you're, you're touching on one of the issues that broadcasters are in this sort of post aereo environment, um, looking at r r pretty pr w with a, a pretty strong focus right now. Because, in fact, they were looking at it before, but so many things were sort of saying, "Okay, we got to wait and see what happens with this case." Yeah. Now that we know that, we're moving on. And there are some technologies that um, a, a number of broadcasters are all looking at. 
Um, some of them are looking at one versus another. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the question is whether there's going to be un uniformity amongst them. Mm -hmm. But as you've already seen, you know, ABC does it one way, NBC does it another, CBS may be doing it another, those kinds of things. Um, and those are networks versus how their local affiliates carry. So it's, it's a pretty important and big uh, and involved ecosystem yes, that has some great traditions to it. Uh, how do you maintain those, the best of those traditions, but also expand the capabilities for consumers to have, you know, better services? particularly today in a world where they would like to have more content portability, as it's called, being able to take the content with you, view it on demand anytime, any device. Uh, and so this is, I think, if, if not issue one, one of the top few uh, on, on most television broadcasters' um, horizon right now. And uh, there, there's a lot of hard work. It's behind the, the, the curtain, mostly. But a lot of hard work being done, I can tell you, on uh, trying to figure out how to to not have the kind of consumer ex uh, bad experience, bad consumer experience you're talking about there, and <clears throat> to also enable other uh, uh, consumers to have even more capability to consume and enjoy the content uh, in as many different environments uh, as possible, whether it's live and in real time or the next day offline. Um, and uh, portable from one device to another. And a lot of it is about <clears throat> what we're calling authentication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, if, it, it's, it's, too, it's tough to say because this isn't really a technology problem as much as it is um, a content rights issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are so many contracts and agreements that go all the way up the chain, even beyond the networks, uh, upstream from there. Um, all of those, again, there, there's a lot of traditions involved. Uh, some of those may change, but it's really about how you can honor the rights that are in place uh, and how you can then try to extend them or revise them the next time the agreement comes up for sure, a renegotiation. Sure. And, and, and those agreements were written uh, at a time when your coverage yeah. area was defined by your signal area. And if you right. put something on the Internet, yes, you can do some reasonably effective geographical restrictions, but not to – I mean, there's going to be somebody who's going get, to get around it if they want to. I would love it. If my local ABC affiliate, just like radio stations stream themselves, right. I would love it if my local ABC affiliate would stream itself. And even if I had to somehow reasonably prove that I was a, a Nashville resident or a resident of their DMA, uh, I, I would, you know, that would uh, uh, th that would be fine with me. I don't want to watch the ABC affiliate in Dubuque. I want to watch right. the ABC affiliate right here in Nashville, and right. uh, and and I can't unless I subscribe to cable. And the problem with for me with subscribing to cable, then I got to pay for all the things I don't want, uh, you know, all the shopping right. channels and the sports channels right. and all the stuff that I have absolutely no interest in whatsoever. And uh, you know, I was just tired of a two hundred and thirty dollar cable bill for for internet and basic stuff. Yeah, and and certainly the cable industry hears that. Uh, they hear it loud and clear from a lot of different venues uh, above, above and below, yeah. Um, yeah. and and they, they they know they're dealing with that. Uh, th there's the whole push towards a la carte or unbundling, yeah. um, and it, it, I think where you'll see it end up happening is probably not to a pure a la carte where you literally buy each channel by itself because nobody's going to like the way those are priced yeah. either yeah. if they have to go that way. And what you're seeing is more and more smaller tiers. Um, and where it used to be basic and premium, and that was it. Now you have a lot of different tiers, and you're seeing more and more slices and packages. Um, so they're working on it from that direction. The other direction is how you authenticate as a broadcast user, like you're saying. And um, while some of the con uh, broadcasters are looking at a cable solution, and that's what the so-called TV everywhere, um, where you use the cable uh, authentication, which is basically was built originally for premium cable content, but right. just to now use it for other any channel. Um, there's another approach that's a little more broadcast centric, which is called sync back. Hmm. We talk about it a little bit in the book, um, and it's a um, it's a system that allows uh, through it's uh, as I say more optimized for broadcast over the air to be able to authenticate not to be as a customer, a paying customer, like cable is concerned about, but really just to say, where are you? 
you're, you're, it's a geofencing kind of a mechanism. Mm -hmm. If uh, you're familiar with that term, you, you sort of alluded to it. This idea that says, yes, I am a customer, a bona fide customer of this TV channel yeah. just yeah. by the nature of where I live. Um, as my primary residence. And if I'm in a certain zip code or whatever, or geographic area, I am qualified to get that content. And so now it's a matter of that technology, which is already out there, being deployed, implemented. It's not expensive to do. And then it's a matter of, and this is the tougher part, the broadcasters saying, okay, now we have this mechanism for saying, yes, with great robustness, we're only serving, even though we might be streaming something out on the internet, we're still only serving that same geographically limited market. Um, and uh, we can do that, we can say that with, with really high confidence that we're only gonna be serving those sa that same population, it, even if we're not doing it over the air, but doing it through other, some, some sort of IP distribution mechanism. And that's the part now that has to kind of percolate through the, the rights environment to say, yeah, we, we trust that. We trust that just as much as we know that your transmitter signal is going to yeah, run out at some <laughs> yeah. point, yeah. you know, at some radius away from the tower. Wow. Skip, that's very interesting. And I, I would love to see that happen. I mean, for my own selfish reasons, too. Yeah. I can't watch the two most popular shows I want to watch right now unless I pay a whole lot of money to people I don't want to pay money to. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's technological restriction i mean i i would have loved an aereo type service but i understand you know the problems that broadcasters had with 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 that um you know maybe the broadcasters will be able to stream and and uh, and respect the rights of the the content creators uh, who uh, deserve to be paid for for their work and the and the royalties and the more successful uh, their work is and the more they get paid yeah it's a big food chain as you yeah. say and 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 you know that's something that broadcasters couldn't even do themselves uh, as you said, like TV broadcasters can't do what radio stations do, which is, by and large, stream their content full time. Um, if stations couldn't do it, how should some third party be able to do it and actually monetize it uh, on their backs? And not only not paying, uh, violating the, the, the rights of the broadcasters themselves, but also all those, those people upstream from the broadcasters who have content because they weren't even doing the compulsory license. I don't want to geek out too much on this whole legal thing, but it's really been, the, the, the best thing about the area process was it really got some discussions going at a, at a realistic level throughout the industry, not just broadcasting, but certainly within broadcasting, which were things that needed to be talked about, but were being kind of swept aside or just uh, curtailed because, well, we can't go there because we don't have the rights, and so it's not even worth looking at, and so on. So now that discussion is really at a, at a, at a high, high pace, and uh, we're looking for some kind of really consumer benefit um, in a, the pretty near future for addressing this in a way that makes sense to all the stakeholders involved, including uh, the consumer and their, their need for uh, and desire for um, greater f uh, flexibility and convenience. Gotcha. Skip, uh, you know, and the, hey, even the ideas in the last few minutes we've been talking about, which uh, are not necessarily addressed directly in the book, the technology behind them is addressed in, right. in, in the book. Yeah. So, highly recommended for engineers who want to know about their counterparts, know about more about their own job. Maybe they, you know, kind of were behind the door when the PSIP was being talked about. Uh, <laughs> and for uh, managers and other non engineers, Great, uh, great book to have. I, I'm, I'm glad I got my copy, and I will begin to read it now. Uh, this is available, I guess, at, at Amazon. Yep, and through the publisher, Focal Press, who uh, NAB works with on a number of books, uh, including this one. Um, but you can get it at any online bookseller as well. It's available in hard copy and and uh, hardback and soft bound. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and also as an ebook uh, on Kindle. Uh, on the Apple platform and on uh, a number of other sort of educationally focused um, ebook platforms for uh, from the the academic community. I gotta believe this is an awesome reference if you are in uh, in school and you mm -hmm. want you're interested in broadcasting and, and engineering, whether you're a, a talent behind the scenes uh, uh, production work or you're going to do engineering. Uh, this is information you need to have. Right. Thanks. I appreciate that, and I think it's true. Uh, more and more nowadays, uh, 
folks who are even on the pure creative side need to know as much as they can about the technology they're working with. Good deal. Skip, thanks for your time. I appreciate you coming on and, and spending the time with us and explaining the things that you have and uh, enlightening us. And thanks for taking the effort to uh, write the book, too. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it, Kirk. Good luck and good to see you. All right. Well, look at that. I'll make sure I'm back here. Okay. I think you can hear me okay. All righty. Well, those of you watching, Skip Peasy and Kirk Harnack, kibitzing uh, about things of what we're doing in broadcasting. So let's recap. Basically, the world has changed as we know it. Broadcasting started out as something very simple, straightforward. We, made, we uh, created a program, put a signal on a link out to the transmitter, and off it went to the radio ether, and then our radios received it, whether it be on a Walkman, you know, Walkman brand, that is, uh, or a car radio, or even at home on a stereo uh, Consulate, as it used to be known. Things have changed. Now you can use something as simple as this. Uh, I'm showing a picture, uh, actually showing a smartphone that has the ability to receive data wirelessly. And now all of a sudden I can listen to my favorite radio station or even watch, maybe watch my favorite TV show. Unlike Kirk, who says, it's right, you can't really watch everything because broadcasts have become somewhat uh, goofy about how to do stuff. In any case, uh, it's food for thought. And the book that they're talking about, let's see if I wrote that down, Broadcast Engineering t Tutorial for Non-Engineers. The industry has changed. We've become a do-it-yourself type of society. I've said this before on the program many times. And I think it's time for us as engineers to start realizing, uh, you know, we need to learn more than just simply Ohm's Law, Kirchhoff's Law, and a few other laws that are out there regarding electronics and, and where things go and how they work. And I think it's time to understand more of the workflow. That's my favorite term these days, is workflow uh, understanding. And I will say this. Today I was at a meeting uh, with a f couple of people who are not technical at all. Actually, it was a chief financial officer of an uh, organization and one of the board members of the organization's uh, board, board of trustees, and talking about their needs. And we first went in talking about intercom systems based on IP. And then we started talking some more and discovered that their real need was not in the IP world, I mean the intercom world, was actually distributing video throughout their facility for training purposes. Right now they're currently using you know, hardwired cable distribution. They're actually using DirecTV and a few other satellite services that bring in some of the outside video. And then they have a couple of channels they modulate on their system for internal. We talked about over-the-top technology. And they were like, well, you know, if we do this, we do that. I said, no, no, think about it. You can do a lot. You can get metrics. You can... Uh, use, uh, what do you call it, uh, controlled access. So when somebody logs in, their login de determines what they can access or not. So now all of a sudden we went from the $300, $400 you know, television drop in each room or office or, or you know, convention, uh, convention, conference center to something where they could take a set-top box with an Ethernet connection, plug it into any spigot in their facility, and now all of a sudden with the person's login they can access what they need. Take that to the next level, now that IP link could be brought outside the building, and now they can take two campuses and bring them together. And again, through that simple, I'm just doing this very simple stuff, you now have an extension of what you're doing with the, your, your, your programming. So why then would a television or broadcasters put their content in the hands of a third party? Why don't you do it themselves? Things to think about. But in order for you to think about it and understand it, you have to sort of read about where we're going and what, what's happening. So I think this video was great. Check it out on the website once we get everything posted after the show. You should uh, you know, watch it some more. The book is worth the investment. Uh, Skip Pease is well-educated in this area. He knows a lot of us. We've all talked. We've had seminars. We you know, sit at the bar and talk about, boy, wouldn't it be nice if? And then what he's done, now working with the NAB, he's taken it to the next level. He's put it in print. He's uh, going on the road and talks to, talk to people about it. So I think, uh, you know, th this is the time now. This is the year, 2014, to start thinking about what if. What if I could do this? How about that? Why not this? Let's think out of the box, as the old saying uh, has been taught it about. So that's my, my two cents for the uh, pe previous video that you saw. But before we get any farther into the two cents that I have to offer throughout our This Week in Radio Tech, episode 221, uh, you know, with the, with the ability for me, Kirk, Tom, and, and Chris, all of us to be able to talk to you and be this one-on-one -on -one and enjoy our weekly get-togethers and sometimes we get to meet at the NAB or CCBE or AES or SBE regional conventions. Our sponsors help us. All right, advertising, whatever you want to call it. But basically, people who are 
of the thought or the mindset that what we're doing and what we're trying to do makes sense and it's worth investing. So they're willing to give us a couple of bucks to make what you see possible that does cost us bandwidth and, and studio time and other things. So I'm going to get into it with our next sponsor, the first sponsor you heard already. I won't repeat it just to be fair to the upcoming sponsor we have. And I misplaced a few things here, so let's, let's be careful now. So the sponsor we have this portion of the broadcast, or netcast I should say, is a Telos. And it's a Telos hybrid. Now, I'm going to mention a few names of Telos hybrids, you should, model numbers you should remember. Telos 10, Telos 100, how about the 100 Delta, remember those? And then there's the perennial Telos 1, come on, everyone remembers the Telos 1, we use that in everything possible. I used to use it for intercom system integration so we could do, uh, folks can dial in off, off site into the intercom system and be part of the you know, party line group. So very versatile box. And with the internal processing that uh, Steve Church implemented back in the early days, the quality of a Telos hybrid was you know, second to none. And we all know that, so I'm not going to you know, pussyfoot around and, and give you any, any uh, that, that marketing jargon. You've used it, you know it, it has a reputation. I mentioned Telos hybrids, it's like someone talking to you about a Mercedes. You don't question which Mercedes it is, you just know. When I tell you Telos hybrids, you know. So with that comes the Telos 2 family. Remember the 2101? It's still out there, it's still in use. I know, because I've used it on many occasions recently, and I work with folks who still use the 2101. So now we move forward. As Skip Peasy talked about, when is the new media no longer new? When does the technology shift? And how do we learn? What do we do? We now come to our newest family, the uh, Telos HX6. Right? It's a six-line talk show system. Think of it as the new... 1x6, Telos 1x6 on steroids. It gives you more you can do with. And what, what, are, what would it be nice? How would it be nice to be able to tell your folks, programming especially, right? You're a talk show station. Maybe you're doing sports. Maybe you're doing just straight talk, local or national. And you're talking to your PD, program director, about what you're doing by investing in this HX6. And he says, what's the big deal? What's the, it's just a phone hybrid. I can get anybody's hybrid. There's several others out there, whatever, right? Vinny Bombats could sell me something. So what? Which, here's what you do. You explain to them. Say, well, you're familiar with the Omnia audio processor? Absolutely. Who isn't? That makes your market signature. That, that puts you on the top of the heap. Well, guess what? Inside every HX6, six-line talk show system, there's a little bit of an Omnia in it. And there's a spectral processor. And why would you do that? Well, we all know phone audio, and we'll get technical now. The phone audio is spiky. It's peaky. It has a lot of peaks and valleys because that's the way phone company audio gets processed. What better way to control peaky audio, to think of it like music, but with a spectral processor? And what better processor to choose than an Omnia engine? Now, of course, it's not a multi-band, 12-band Omnia inside your phone hybrid. It's a three-band spectral processor. That's all you need. Let's be honest. The spectrum you work with on the phone line is very limited. But you're using Omnia AGC algorithms. You're using the spectral processing approach from an Omnia in your phone hybrid. That's why you don't have to question. Telos hybrid. Does it sound good or not? Of course it does. That's why. So you want to have an advantage. You want to have, want to be able to raise your hand in that meeting with the PD and maybe music director or maybe other folks or the jocks even. A jock me and say, what's the big deal? Tell them, not only do you get the processing of Omnia on the air for the main program that everybody loves to hear, but every time there's a phone call, there's a little bit of Omnia in that call. And that's what brings it all together. Now, what else is the, can you do with it? Well, if you have live wire, you plug a live wire in, and you're off to the races, and you're done. If you don't, it's a standalone hybrid, two hybrids, one for the guest calls, and then the other is for the VIP. And then you can do either ISDN connectivity or POTS. So either way, you can still do traditional POTS, or if you're lucky enough, you can take three ISDN lines, put it into the back, because each ISDN line has two numbers, two, four, six. There's your six lines. So either way, it's flexible. And then you can have up to, I believe, it's 12 V-sets plugged into it. So the V-sets are an IP phone headset. So you're already moving forward, taking advantage of the technology, and future-proofing yourself. So as you move forward and decide to go with an Axios system, maybe it's IQ, maybe it's Element, maybe it's even beyond, you already have a part of it. Because if your phones are part of your programming and are crucial to your broadcast day, you're already halfway there. What better way to start? Again, it's a Telos hybrid. That's all you have to remember. Just remember this, though. The model number you need to remember is HX6, six-line talk show system. And, well, there's so many things you can do with it. It's a phone hybrid. Select calls. It works with the software to screen calls. So this call screening is done. 
everything you expect. But the best part, the best part you must remember is the audio quality because at the end of the day, at the end of the conversation, it's what the person heard on the radio. When your famous or popular talk show host is talking to a caller, engaging the community, you want to hear the clarity, you want to be able to understand what they say, either agree or disagree, or you know, chime in with your opinions, and we all have them, you can do it. You can get up to six opinions per, call, per show, per, per moment, because it's a six-line hybrid. Or you can do five and have a VIP give his opinion, and five you know, community guests uh, call us from the, from the audience. So either way, everybody gets their two cents in, but with the quality of an Omnia processor, the quality intelligibility that you expect from a Telus hybrid, all in a simple box. It's a one RU box. Oh yeah, did I mention that's one RU? Yeah, if you remember the 2101s, there's several RUs, it's kind of big, it's got a lot of fancy things. Okay, there's a reason for that. But for right now, six lines, one RU, live wire enabled. You can do uh, AES EVU, you can do six pots, six I, uh, three ISDN, which makes six lines, six numbers. And if you want really great quality, do ISDN interface. Why? ISDN is digital from the central office to the hybrid. The hybrid already is digital DSP based and has Omnia processing, so you get best of everything. The worst part is you can't control if, they use, if your call is using one of those NFL Sports Illustrated football phones. Remember those? Those audio quality, that audio quality, you know, well, that's to be you know, questioned. But at least you know, once you're connected to the central office from the phone company to you, digital, from you in the studio to your transmitters, digital, transmitters out on the HD radio is digital, your audience is going to get three quarters of the best signal they can get. That one quarter they can't control, that's the person calling in. Hopefully, if the person has got the wherewithal and intelligence and is willing to speak properly to your host, then you're in great shape. If not, so be it. That's the way it goes. So, Telos HX6, six-line talk show system. Give it a try. Check it out. Telos-systems.com. Click on the uh, pull-down menu for phones and select it from there. Real straight, simple, straightforward. All right? There you go. So that's our sponsor for this half of the show, Telos. And the other sponsor you heard in the early half, so back on the uh, show on demand, you can check out who we spoke with op at the opening of the show, just before Skip Peasy and Kirk's talked about where things are going with the uh, industry and how, how we've uh, shaped up, or we're not shaping up. So there you have it. So now let's see. How much time do I have left? Oh, look at that. I lost track of my time. And you're trying to help everybody out and pay attention. You know, there was something I wanted to show everyone. How many times you drive past the skyline and, uh, or you know, a large billboard and you see those lights and the, the outdoors advertising, it's, you know, it's definitely an LED panel and it's pretty cool and you can, they can change stuff on the fly and beats the old days of a guy climbing out on a, on a, on a ladder and unra unraveling or unfurling a, a poster, gluing it up and hoping it stays through the rain. I had a chance yesterday uh, in Manhattan to work on top of a building, uh, or a flat rooftop this time, I wasn't hanging off the side, a uh, flat rooftop uh, alongside of a couple of digital signs that, are, that illuminate across the Manhattan skyline. And uh, one of the technicians was kind enough to show me and actually give me this. Uh, unfortunately, for those of you listening to this uh, netcast, you won't be able to see it, so you're going to have to watch the video. But I'll describe it to you. It's a small cube. It's a one-inch square cube that I'm holding up. And in it, in the epoxy, uh, is, uh, are LEDs. There's about uh, nine of them. And they're red, green, and blue. There's, little, there's more red than blue, more in the green. And that's what they do. Take this in a four-by-four four panel, four-foot-by-four-foot four panel, and there's, there's hundreds of these little squares all, at, all uh, snapped in, and then they create a big illusion of a large digital sign. And they're all connected with this little ribbon cable that I'm showing. It's very, very straightforward. As you can see, it's four wires, red, green, blue, and yellow, yellow being the ground, and then they select which LEDs get lit up. I just thought it was pretty cool to show this and talk about it because these are the kinds of things that are happening now in the world of IP, the world of, of content creation, distribution, and we in radio especially have it made because we have one less component to worry about, the video. But I take that back. We do have to worry about the video. That's that web thing now. So engineers, those of us who are learning, those of you who are watching this who are not engineering types, maybe programming types, maybe tinkerers, learn the, the inner workings. Understand what makes the light, that uh, fluorescent panel look the way it does or that outdoor sign that looks like it does with the LEDs as I'm holding the cube up in my hand again. It's pretty cool. I only say it because it helps you think. It just, yeah, you sit back, you tap a cup of coffee and think about these things, and that's, that's the way to go. So with that, let's see, look at the time now. It's 3.02. I think we started roughly on time. I may have a couple of seconds left. I'll ask Andrew just to Skype text me real quick. In the meantime, those of you who are, are, are wondering, don't forget, in October, AES in L.A. Okay, got it. 
And uh, don't forget, in Canada, you have CCBE coming up in September. There's a lot of events taking place online, so webinars you should check out. And everything we have on the website, you can find out more. And don't forget, also patronize our other folks here at the GFQ Network, because there's a few other shows that you should check out, okay? What the Tech is one of them. And I'll just mention the name Paul Therod. If you know the name, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know the name, tune in, check it out. All right? So this is going to conclude this week's episode, 221. 221 episodes of This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Chris Tobin. I'm a... Uh, independent consultant. I do a lot of work with folks, both TV and radio, and uh, a lot of IP-based stuff. And it's fun. So if you want to find out more, you can reach out to me at uh, info at ipcodex.com. That's where you'll find me. Otherwise, you can check out what we do here at This Week in Radio Tech. So with that, I thank you all for tuning in and look forward to catching up with you sometime in the future. And let's look forward to next week for another This Week at Radio Tech.